This week's podcast with Di Caudron and Debbie O'Brien of Appleton's Wool is sponsored by the Embroiderers Guild of America at egausa.org. Each month, EGA offers an expansive roster of creative and educational opportunities for needleworkers around the globe. Starting April 28, EGA members can register for a fascinating new virtual lecture, Boyaji, Stitching and Wrapping Happiness with Young Min Lee. Interested listeners can read an interview with Young Min Lee on the EGA website to learn more about this uniquely beautiful form of Korean textile art. Then use the code FiberTalk5, that's FiberTalk and the number 5, to get a $5 discount on this or any of EGA's virtual lectures, including previous recordings. Learn more at egausa.org. Thanks to EGA for sponsoring the show, and now our conversation with Di and Debbie of Appleton's Wool. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. We have two artists this week from Appleton's Wool, uh, Di Caudron, who is the owner. Di, welcome. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here. Oh, this is going to be fun. And then the person who's in charge of wool management and 5,000 other things at Appleton's <laughs> Wool, Debbie O'Brien. Debbie, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Uh, so much here. There's so much history with Appleton's Wool. Uh, just doing the research, I knew it was old because uh, I've been stitching a long time, and when I started, it was... <laughs> ballpoint canvas and Appleton's wool and whether you like it or not. And, um, uh, but then when I looked 1835 yeah. is when it started and die, you, you and Julia bought the company in 2013. That's right. Yeah. Wow. hundred, so 178 year old company you buy. Yes. We, <laughs> we actually, that? <laughs> well, we, we bought it from the last Appleton who decided to give it, give up. And um, so we are the first non-Appleton owners ah. um, since since 1835. Wow. So it's... I think the company has gone through quite a lot of changes over those years. Um, but it's a very interesting history. How impressive that it stayed in the family that long. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Because, yeah, most, most companies these days, the kids don't. They don't want any of it. Yeah. I guess they had big families in those days, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what was that like, buying a company with that kind of history? I mean, not not just manufacturing history, but needlework history. I mean, that that's a, Appleton's Wool has just been a staple for so long in needlework. What's that like to buy a company like that in today's market? And well, you know, there must be a was... real mixture of, of dealing with tradition and history and then modernization. Absolutely. Um, it um, it was very tough at the beginning because um, the company was not in good shape by the time we, we got to it in 2013. And um, so we really had to bring it into the 21st century, um, which has been the challenge from the, from the start. And of course, as you so rightly say, Wool now has, there are so many competitors, whereas at the beginning, we were probably the world leader and that there weren't, there was no other company that produced that number of colors. Right. Unquestioned. Um, yeah. Unquestioned. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. And we've, we've still kept up the, the fact that we have 425 colors on our, in our range in two weights of wool and which we, this is what, how we took the company over in 2013 and we've kept that going. We've introduced some more new brighter shades to, as you say, to, to go into the new markets ahead of us, um, which has proved very successful. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's very nice to have something with that heritage because um, Appleton's is very closely linked with uh, William Morris in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, mm -hmm. when, when tapestry was phenomenal. Uh, and there are um, examples of that all over the UK that you can visit and see wonderful, wonderful tapestries. And Appleton's was providing all the wool in those days. But, of course, <laughs> times change. Right. As, and um, we, we're moving ahead now. 
So we're looking ahead rather than back, I think. Right. Now, when when you uh, purchase the company, um, uh, colors, but you have, uh, I'm sure, people who worked there forever and machinery that needed to be upgraded. Uh, we had we had some we inherited some machines that were 120 years old. Holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, we, we, we were, comp we, we didn't take any of the personnel because we moved the company out of London. Uh. So we're now in Oxfordshire. We're very close to Oxford. And, um, so n none of the employees came with us and we started absolutely from scratch and uh, we survived with those very old machines for about two years and now we've replaced everything so we now have a very modern scanning machine we have a coning machine and time and we've bought computers would you believe they <laughs> had nothing but a typewriter oh no <laughs> yeah and no website no you know i mean we've started from scratch really wow so, um, but I think all the employees, they basically were retire retirement oh, yes. age, weren't they? Oh, yes. So they, they were all And they were all very to happy retire. to go. <laughs> yeah, well, they've had enough. They weren't quite as old as the company, but getting that yeah. way. So, yeah. um, so it no. gave them a nice exit then. Yeah, oh, exactly. I think so. no, it's I think given so. us new life. Um, yeah. so, so that's how it all happened. Wow. So then that tells me there's, there's some kind of a lull in manufacturing as you, as you get all of this back in place then. Well, yeah, the first two years were tough, I yeah. have to admit. So I um, think that the most difficult thing, I think, was um, the fact that as the, as the old owner was kind of, I don't want to say losing interest, but, um, you know, when, when we took the company over, we were out of stock of a lot of colours. Um, and, and that was the most, the biggest challenge, actually, was trying to make sure that we got back into stock of all the colours in both weights, because that's what we never want to be out of stock of anything because and, and that can be really difficult when you've got effectively well 425 colors in two weights right. you know that's 850 dye lots that you've got to keep on top of with minimum order quantities and so that was the biggest challenge was was getting back into stock of everything and then with the machinery it was the machines that the, the old machines that that we inherited were the scaling machines and they they really looked sort of like something out of Rumble Stiltskin, didn't well, they? Well, out I mean, of Dickens, actually. Dickens. Yes. <laughs> they, were, they were these really old, very manual machines, and mm. that's going back to those white labels because the labels were then all sort of individually gummed um, and put onto to each of the skeins, and it was incredibly time-consuming and incredibly labour-intensive. And so... Uh, but but it took a little while for us to uh, but but actually in saying that they worked um so the machines worked and and um and it wasn't as if that there was a problem with the manufacturing there it was just that it was labor intensive and right. we knew that if we wanted to to grow and increase we needed to come up with a more sort of automated way of of creating the skeins so that's when we then sort of effectively went to market and and found a uh, an automatic scanning machine and um yeah and then that that took a little while to bed in but um but now it's all all fully running and <laughs> much more automatic and one yeah. guy can run it so uh yeah it's good and hence the different labels because uh, it was uh you couldn't have the individual white gummed labels it needed to be something that different so yeah, yeah, I, I ran over uh, yesterday to Sign of the Arrow because they carry uh, the full line of your wool, and I just yeah. grabbed a bunch. I'm sure they thought I was nuts because I didn't have a project. I just wanted some <laughs> skeins of wool because I hadn't handled wool in years, Appleton's yeah. wool in years. And, and so I bought 10 skeins, and two of them have these very generic white labels on them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then the others are these red and silver, beautiful, glossy Appleton's wool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the old ones, the the white ones are the are the older. Exactly, they were made on your Dickensian years, huh? machines. Yeah. Yes, so yeah. <laughs> they were. Uh, now I, I had a, a plant tour for my par paying job, which mm -hmm. is editing a magazine, ed a manufacturing magazine, mm -hmm. and we went into a plant, and it was very much a mixture of legacy and and new machinery. And yeah. On one end are these massive metal presses. Mm -hmm. I mean, giant, like multi-storied metal presses that are just <laughs> ancient. 
And uh, and the guy said that, you know, these things still work. So I, when you said that, yeah, they still work. They still get the job done. And they use yeah. them all the time. But he yeah. said any parts that break, we have to we have to have a machine shop make them for make us. Them, well, yeah. that, we were in exactly the same position. Yeah, uh-huh. exactly that. Yeah. And we sort of we started off, I think, when we brought over, didn't we, like six or seven of these machines. There was a number of the yeah. machines. Yes. And we we. We kept sort of taking bits off of one, one to of replace them. the other. <laughs> so we, we always tried to have two that were working. Um, <laughs> but we did end up having a lot of bits. In fact, did they? Did we go? We were thinking of putting them to a museum. They did. They we? went into. They a, went to they a went museum. Into a, there into we go. A wall museum. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when you're down to Robin machines, yeah, you need to do something. Yeah, exactly. It was desperate. It was getting desperate. Oh my! So, th- so now today we we have a fully computerized, uh, exactly. automated as much as possible operation. Yeah. It's well, it still needs uh, it still needs a machinist on it all the time, mm-hmm. but it's um, yeah, it's it's computerized to a certain extent. Yeah. To a certain extent, um, yeah. because it's, I mean, what we do here is only really the end part of the, the picture. Um, I mean, we are, you know, we, we employ or we, we keep a lot of British manufacturing, textile manufacturing companies busy um, because all of our, our wool is British. So that comes from the British Wool Board. And that so that's all keeping the farmers hopefully yeah. <laughs> busy, and then um, and then it goes from there. We, we it then obviously has to go through the various different processes. Uh, it's then all spun up in in Yorkshire. And actually, when I went to see the machines there, that's a little bit like um, it, it, these enormous mills. And um, you know, if you go back, went back sort of a hundred years, there were so many of these mills up in up in Yorkshire, and now it's they're there but a lot of them have sadly been turned into flats and things but um well let's but let's let's back up let's back up yeah. take us through that whole process so so all of the wool comes from from british sheep farmers yeah oh. so it all comes so so the british sheep, sheep farmers form um i guess is, is a collective i suppose is which is the the british wool board and so our wool all comes from the british wool board and it's certified so that you know they can it's all traceable back to um back to the auction i suppose because the the british wool board hold, hold auctions i think it's about 14 times a year or something and um and at those auctions you can trace our wool back to the different lots um so yeah so that's how the wool is has to be bought from the british okay, wool right. board. Par- pardon me intensely curious on all fronts here mm-hmm. so so when you say an auction so somebody from appleton's goes to these auctions and, and no bids we on actually wool? we have a wool so it's the price is set um, I'm, I'm, yeah, the price gets set. So it's auctioned at which point then I think somehow they must set the price for that auction. And then we actually have a, a wool commodity buyer, I suppose, um, who we've dealt with now. In fact, I spoke to him in, in advance of this just to say, Christopher, how long have, has Appleton's been, been using you for, using your family or your company for? And he could go back, uh, he could go back 80 to 85 years. Holy we, we, I know. We've been using <laughs> this, not Christopher, but his father before him and, and his, his grandfather. Fa- grandfather. He talks wow. about his father and his grandfather quite a lot. And um, so they've been our sort of wool merchants, I suppose. They've been our wool merchants and they're up in Yorkshire. So they do. They, he, we speak to him about what we need and, and they know what we need now because they've been dealing with us. For, for forever well that yeah um, that was something i was going to interject here yeah real, you know history aside real value in that they know he knows exactly what you he need knows exactly yeah. yeah which is really specific because when you're looking um for tapestry wool it's really important that you get wool that has uh, what we say is a low beard. So you don't want to have lots of short fibres because if you have lots of short fibres in your wool, you're going to end up with fluffy wool, which is lovely if you want a nice fluffy jumper. (laughs) Not so great if you're trying to stitch with it because you want to have nice sort of sharp lines and you want it to be quite specific. So, um, yes, so he he knows exactly what to look for from, from a sort of grading perspective. And also from a color perspective, so which is which brings up its own challenges because um, 
because we are so insistent that we are British from sheep to needle, so we our wool doesn't leave the country until it's completely done, um, and then we may obviously sell to the states or wherever. Um, but it's it's all using British manufacturing, and the British wool is beautiful. Um, but you have to be really specific when you're buying it that you get as white a wool as you possibly can with as few coloured fibres in it. Because if you're dyeing wool and, and with 425 shades, some of our wool, some of our colours are very light and they're very um, subtle. It, it's really important that you get very, very, a very, very white base in order to to be able to dye those colours accurately. Um, and that's one of that. That's one of the things that we're constantly not, not battling with, but but we have to be is in the forefront of our mind all the time to make sure that we get the right base, the right color wool to start with, in order for the dye to be to be taken up properly. Yeah, yeah. I love on the uh, uh, colors page on your website. Please be patient while this page loads. There's a lot of colors. I love <laughs> I that. <know. laughs> I know it's a lot of colors. And I, and I have a high speed. Uh, very high speed uh, internet connection, and it still took a few minutes. So yeah, I know it does take a while. <laughs> it was but... great. So when when you when he buys wool, uh -huh. does he buy as much as he can of the proper grade or? Yeah, how, how he does. does. That work? So it, it very much depends on, on. So I'll give him projections of what I think our usage is going to be, and then depending on price and depending on um, and depending on whether he thinks it's it's great. So sometimes he'll phone me up and he'll say, um, Debbie, I think you know I, there's a really really some really good tops at the moment. I think it would be worth us getting. I don't. Know, 10,000 kilos or whatever. Um, so so he will also call me and say when he thinks there's a really, really great, uh, uh, you know, a good wool at a good price. Um, and, and that's, yeah, that's, so it's a, so it's a sort of two-way process, really. We work together on it. Um, but, yeah, they, they know exactly what, what, what needs we have. So, so then, um, then it's like yeah. any, any agricultural thing. You're really mm. at the mercy because I'm, I'm mm. sure he might call up one time and say, hey, there isn't very much good here. Um, yeah, you, you kind of, it, it becomes kind of kind of a guessing game at some point. To... Yeah, well, you don't you don't want to buy wool that's too yellow, for example, because if you get wool that's too yellow, it's really hard for us to get our whites dyed. Um, so yeah, it's it's all about the color and the and the quality, um, which will be a diff totally different quality to to that if you were buying for for you know nice soft knitting wool, for example. Yeah, but so, but then yeah. but then I need to produce wool thread but mm -hmm. uh this is not a good au auction this time so we got to get supply it <laughs> yeah it's gotta, yeah up and down all the time yeah yeah but we do we buy it in quite large quantity or we commit to a, a contract in quite large quantities uh -huh. so it hasn't ever really been an issue because okay. um because we'll, we'll go so far in advance we'll you know we'll know we've only got say six months wool left and then we'll go ahead because the whole thing can take a you know the whole process can take quite some time because it's got to go through a lot of different processes before it actually gets to us um, so yeah, we have to be we have to be super organized on it. <laughs> okay, so when he makes a purchase, then he's saying yeah. to the farmers, "We will buy X kilos." Yeah, I guess of... to the wool board. Yeah, which okay. is the, so the collective. Yeah, yeah. So and he'll, then, he'll and then what happens after that? Then it's so then it goes to then it gets it goes through all the various different processes like uh, sort of scouring and sorting and well no by that point actually it's done, that part of it's done. Um, so it would then be, I guess it would get, uh, it would go to our spinner. So we would send it to the spinner. And that, that was the one that I was saying to you about. It was in this really old mill. And it, it's one of the sort of last, I would say, fully working old fashioned mills left up in, up in Bradford. And um, yeah, it's beautiful. And when you walk in there, you, you kind of feel like you've almost stepped back a hundred years when you're walking <laughs> through the corridors and you can, you know, and almost like the steps are sort of, is if you're climbing the sort of stone steps, you know how sometimes if you go into ch old churches and things, you can see where it's been worn down over the years. Right, right. You go into these old mills and you think, gosh, I, you know, I wonder who walked up and down these steps a hundred years ago. And right. it would have been a real throng of activity back then more so. Um, but then you go into the rooms and they've got all the much more modern machinery. Um, but still, some of it still looks pretty old. Um, but our wool would then go there and it would be it, it gets um, spun. And at that point, I say whether or not I want it or the percentage that I want in cruel weight. 
and our cruel weight is a two ply or um, a tapestry weight which is a four ply so they'll spin it and twist it uh, to the to the to our um specifications um and then from then it goes uh back to the the our, our wool merchant and he holds on to it for for us when it's been spun and then from then i will then call off certain amounts and it will get sent to our dyers which is also up in yorkshire and um and they will then dye of the quantity that i require in the color that i need so okay so debbie so you then you are actively involved in all of these steps outside of your headquarters building then you are yeah uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, we have because the relationships. I mean, we've we've dealt with that, and it's also in advance of this. I I phoned up um, my di our diaries and I said, "How long have we? How long has Appledean's been dealing with you guys for?" And and he said, oh, "Let me phone my dad." So, oh, so no. it, it went to the back and forth. So eventually, we figured out that we had records that went back to 1977 um, with the diaries, but mm -hmm. it could have been longer. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I am act very much actively involved. I don't have to be up there all the time because they know exactly what we want. And, yeah. uh, yeah, we've, we've, there's a lot of trust and we've been dealing with them a long time. So, right. yeah, the history yeah. pays off there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So then, uh, so then it just sits, it's all spun and it just sits till you need it or till the, yeah. till it gets dyed. And then mm -hmm. once it's dyed, so I will then send a weekly order up to our dyers and I'll say, you know, I want this much in this color and this much in this color. And, um, and then they'll dye it and then it gets sent down to us and, um, and we then hold it in stock down in Oxfordshire. Um, and we hold it in stock in, in Hanks. And it's then that, uh, we then will either sell it as a Hank or we'll sell it as a skein, which is the two, the ones, the paper wrapped ones that you were talking about. Yeah. And it's in down in Oxfordshire that we have the machine that turns that those hanks via another coning process, which we do here as well. And we turn it then into the skein, the skeins. So a, a lot of your time is spent uh, looking at uh, uh, inventory reports and yes. knowing what colors are Running yes. short and then absolutely, okay. uh, yeah, and also having very complicated Excel spreadsheets that <laughs> <laughs> that can then project, look back over sort of well uh, uh, since 2013 um, when we when we um, computerized everything, I can look back and figure out um, how much I'm likely to need so that I can order it in advance so we don't hopefully ever run out. Yeah. So talk about uh, the impact of the pandemic and so many people while well, still having trouble getting thread. How, mm. how did you battle through that? Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. <laughs> my turn. Um, in fact, uh, I, I worked all the way through on my own, mostly, uh, with the machinist downstairs. We, we sort of stayed away from each other. Um, but I came in every day for the whole of the pandemic. Mm. And managed to get orders out from the very from the very start to the very end uh, and then slowly the staff came back when they were allowed to and but I sort of basically um, treated my home and Appleton's as one thing <laughs> so I never I didn't speak speak to anybody or see anybody in between and beeline back and forth <laughs> as a result yeah we kept going all the way through and of course it was a phenomenal time for us right because people were suddenly realizing how wonderful stitching was when you had all the time in the world and you were stuck at home and you were tearing your hair out because you were miserable um and stitching really came into its own and really we haven't looked back since so that's that but as you were said at the very beginning, it, it was a positive result from from um, from the pandemic. Yeah, um, no, that's uh, I, I think there's no question. And, and we'll see this for years to come that uh, I needle, agree. Need, needlework really benefited um, from a yeah. tragedy. Yeah. Well, and people mm. discovered that actually doing something with your hands and stitching is wonderful therapy. Um, and the doctors were saying we should all be doing something mindful and you know, I'm sure you had exactly the same in the States. Sure. And yeah, um, and so many people have come into stitching that were never knew or never wanted to do it or didn't think they wanted to do it before and now do. So it is a very, very positive result. 
Yeah, um, no, it's uh, and that whole the the mental health thing and quality of life has just changed yeah. the work world dramatically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so many people working from home now have more time, mm -hmm. um, so they can be stitching at home too. So that's a lovely thing. Yes. Um, and it, uh, I mean, obviously we had a huge spike in sales for that year uh, during the pandemic. 2020 was a phenomenal year for us. And um, our turnover has gone down since then, but we are maintaining so many of those new customers that came in then. And not not just um, stitch general stitches of the public, but but also people who started designing kits and are using our wool in their kits, mm -hmm. um, and had time to do that during the pandemic that they never thought they would. <laughs> so we've gained a lot of customers that way. Yeah, a um, lot of designers uh, used up a whole bunch of those ideas they had in their heads, but no time to put on paper. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the mm. fact that we were able to keep supplying wool was very beneficial. So um, yeah, it has. It's been very good for us, I have to say. <laughs> well, that's huge because a lot of thread manufacturers really struggled to uh, keep I up know. with the demand. Yeah. So yeah. I think we were quite lucky and that was where it played into having everything in the UK as well mm -hmm. um, because it, because our supply chain was was pretty tight. Um, we, we were able to turn orders around quite quickly. So when, you know, in the moments where, where people were allowed back to work, um, our dyers sort of were able to really suddenly step it up for us and, and they dyed a whole bunch of, of, of colours that had been had been waiting and, and, and were able to get it out to us because I think everything was UK. And I think a lot of other people who were perhaps finding it more difficult because they were trying to deal with importing things, which was a lot more difficult, I think. Um, yeah, so so it was beneficial for us having a tight supply chain, um, having history with those suppliers as well, yeah. and um, and having everything yeah, locally. Yeah, we all helped each other out. I mean, it was really beneficial. I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's terrific. Yeah, I just did uh, an article for the next issue about supply chains because it's, it's still a gigantic problem in most of manufacturing, and it's it's all shipping and mm -hmm. tracking and quality control because so much so many uh, manufacturers quality control fell off because they were trying to hurry yeah. or they didn't have the right people yeah and so having that tight uh, in-country supply chain huge advantage yes yeah yeah yes in in manufacturing sustainability is mm -hmm. is a huge topic these days Huge. Uh, talk yeah. about how you, I mean, with dyes and, and uh, I'm sure some bleaches and other things. Talk about yeah. how you guys are, are, uh, are doing the sustainability uh, aspect. Okay. So from the point of view that we've got a pretty low, I, I mean, they talk about food miles. I'm going to talk about wool, wool miles. So our wool miles are pretty low because it's all done within the UK. Mm -hmm. um, so so from that perspective, it's really sustainable. We don't, you know, we're, we're not um, shipping our stuff all over the country before it gets to us. Um, from the perspective of uh, farming in the UK, farming sheep is really sustainable. So the three cloven, now I'm going to get this slightly wrong, but, but there's um, something about farming sheep and the way in which the sheep then are able to aerate the soil means that you've got a really, it's a very natural um, way of aerating and, and creating good soil. Mm. Um, so, so from that perspective, it's, it's pretty sustainable. Now, when you come to the dyeing, that's where obviously it's less straightforward because dyeing is pretty um, hungry from the perspective of energy. Right. If you're, you know, you can't dye wool unless you raise the, the temperature of the vats to a certain temperature. So you have to, it, it's pretty energy hungry. It uses a lot of, our dyes use a lot of gas. Um, and so from that perspective, it's it's difficult, but there's not much you can do about it really from, from the dyeing perspective. It, you do have to dye the wool. Now, the dyes that we use, again, because it's really important that we maintain a consistency of color, we can't, for example, our code 671 has always got to look like 671. You know, if somebody's, if somebody's stitching something and they run out of wool and they order more wool and it's a different dye lot, we have to make sure that, that the, the differences between those dye lots are really, really minimal. And so we use the dyes we use. Um, we can't. We. I mean, I know that you've got a lot of dyes out there that use very natural dyes. We have to use an acid leveling dye, 
and wool a lot of dyes for wool are acid because actually alkali will destroy wool so in order for dye to be taken up it has to be in a sort of acidic um dye however when you know what our wool diet has signed up to is they're part of an environmental club for once want of a better word called the ippc and what that means is any affluent um that that comes from the dyeing they have to make sure that when they when they what well, well they do it with with yorkshire water they have to make sure that that when it's um you know when they get rid of it it's at the right ph it's at the right temperature there's no sulfide there's no chemical oxygen in it um and they have to adhere to all the right rules and regulations when when um you know when when getting rid of it um to make sure that it's safe so so that is as sustainable as it possibly can be at the moment um they also recycle a lot of their water so that they don't have to constantly sort of uh, so that they're trying to to reduce their gas usage as well um so they try to recycle their their hotter water um so they burn less gas so so they the dyers try to be as sustainable as they can and they are signed up as i said to the to the uh the environmental um ippc um but but that's the difficulty is in the dyeing of it i suppose but it's um yeah it's as good as it can be and then um well, i think that everything uh, else that, yeah that, that probably speaks to uh just about any chemistry based operation in the world is yeah. if if you're sensitive to sustainability in the environment there there is a point where you simply have to use chemicals and yeah. there's, there's yeah. no getting around it there's yeah. nothing you can we can do about it i mean but there are chemicals that we now can't use for example so moth proofing um the the actual what you would use normally for moth proofing um that's now been banned in the uk you can't use that because of the danger to the aquatic environment mm -hmm. so we don't we aren't able um to moth proof our wool and actually it's not been a problem um so so we haven't had, I think, I, I, I can't even remember when we've ever had anybody saying that they've had an issue with, their, with the wool being, um, you know, not being moth-proofed. Um, so that's one of the things that we, we are very, you know, aware of. So, so we do, we, we know that we can't use that, that um, chemical, for example, which I think is, per, per, I might get this spell, this, say this slightly wrong, but I think it's permethrin, and that's something that's now been banned. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... So yeah, we're as we're as good as we possibly can be. And and dye lots, uh, you know, that's got to be just a, a constant uh, situ monitor, you know, monitoring situation there. Uh, uh, have your your formulas for each dye lot, and mm -hmm. then sticking to that. But even within that, it's got to be really tough because you're dealing with the uh, wool, which varies, yeah. I'm sure, from lot to lot. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that that again is quite a manual process, actually. So you would think that you can just, um, you know, press a button and 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 that will give you the correct uh, recipe, I suppose. And, and in a way, yes, that's sort of the case. Of course, there's recipes. Um, but it, every single time we die, it requires uh, a, a dyer, a real master dyer who knows what they're doing um, to make sure that the, the wool's in for exactly the right amount of time, um, that it's because each, as you say, it's a natural fiber. So it, it differs each time. So yes, there's a lot of manual input on dyeing. It's not just a matter of, of plugging in a recipe and, and, and walking away at all. Yeah, it's a kind of, it's a kind of thing where we talk about automating manufacturing uh, on so many fronts, but at, at some point for things like this, there, there's an art form and an experience that has to be in place or you just mm. won't be successful. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yep. The mm. sheep, sheep ate more clover this time. It's not taking yeah. up the dye. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh boy. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So then, uh, uh, you get the, the, the thread dyed and, mm -hmm. uh, then it's, it's stored uh, on Hanks, and then you you put yeah. it into skeins. Yeah, absolutely. So it's stored on Hanks um, with us, and um, and then some of it we put into skeins, and some of it we sell as Hanks. So a lot of the background colours people will want to order as Hanks. Some of our some of our um, customers are carpet repairers, for example, and they will want their wool in Hanks. Um, some of our kit makers will want their wool in hanks because they might put in sort of half a hank into a kit. So we sell quite a lot actually in hanks. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, yes, we, we, we will turn it into the smaller skeins as well. Yeah, and that was something I was uh, curious about that didn't show up in any, any of my research is 
where your uh, wool is used outside of needlework. So carpet repair and... Yeah, so we've got carpet repair, we've got weaving, um, we sometimes it's used in, in punch wool, for example. So quite a lot of um, our new, we've got some new kit makers that use it in punch wool. Um, what else? I'm trying to think. What else is it used in dye? Well, it's not just used in the home, of course, because it's it's used for a lot of public works all around the country mm. and all around the world. Um, that's a growing thing. That's another thing that grew in the pandemic, actually, that the people got together as communities and started to, like they used to, um, create something wonderful within a community where everybody joins in. Um, but no, I think we've covered where our wall goes. In, I mean, a lot of it obviously goes to kit makers now. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we have a big um, carpet um, rug restorer mm. in New York, for example, who takes huge amounts of wool um, and it's used in re restoration all across America. <laughs> Um, would have never so, thought of that. Yeah. 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 Well, they, well uh, th that's because of that. We've got so many colors that really helps. Yeah. To match into your, your original carpet. Yeah. Well, um, the, uh, the shop near me here near in St. Louis side yeah. of the arrow, uh, when I, I went in and bought a few skeins of, of Appleton's wool and, uh, they, they have a unique aspect of their business. They sell a lot of needlepoint or in your case, tapestry belts. Yes, mm. yes, absolutely. And, yeah, uh, a, a lot of them. And yeah. she had a bunch of them hanging up there. I assume they were had come back from the finisher to have the buckles and things put on. And she said just about all of them, at least the background, if not the entire belt, was stitched with Appleton wool. And she said that the reason it's it's done and it's all uh, two ply. Is she says it just lasts forever, and so. Well, for... Were they from Good Threads? Do you know? Mm. Did you look at the manufacturer? No, I no, I didn't. No. All oh, right. No. No, because we have a company called Good Threads who we sell to, who oh. are are an NGO um, and use Haitian stitches, uh, and they are making those beautiful belts for everybody across america oh. particularly i mean they're, they're they they tend to be found in golf clubs everywhere oh no th these um, uh, this shop then, sells painted canvas belts and then people stitch right them. Yeah. right that's yeah. different yeah. yeah but yeah she said this it just never wears out so <laughs> that's what no well use. that's so true they're v it's a very sensible thing to use for a belt mm. it'll last mm. forever yeah so yeah, I'll let I'll let my um I'll let my wool buyer know that uh, he's clearly choosing the right wool right, for us. Right. <laughs> well, she 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 had no hesitation whatsoever. She says it just never wears out. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Four hundred and twenty colors, and I'm sure growing. Four hundred and twenty-five. <laughs> Four, oh, twenty-five now. Okay. Yeah. Twenty-five. Yeah. yeah. So that whole process. Now you inherited, I'm sure, a vast majority of those colors. Yeah. But then uh, um, talk about what you're doing to bring new colors in and, and where do you look for colors? Are we, are we going brighter or what, what, what's the approach? Yeah, well, we've, de we've definitely got brighter. Um, but I think that was because I, I, I don't think there'd been a huge amount of new colors in the, probably the 10 years prior to, to um, die buying the business. And so how did we choose? Well, we ch we put in three ranges, uh, sorry, four ranges um, about a year ago. Um, so we did bubblegum pink. Um, it sounds like we're all a bit sweet addicts here. We did bubblegum pink. We did sort of fizzy <laughs> sherbets. Um, and then we did a couple of neons, like a bright neon and a cool neon range. Um, and so those we, we went to our customers and we said, what what colors do you think we're missing? We know, you know, we've got 400 at that point. I think we probably had about 420 because there were some colors that that were so close to others that in order to bring on the new colors, we discontinued. But um, we said, you know, what is it we're missing? And and that was we sort of when we put it out on Instagram and we kind of were saying, look, guys, you know, if you could choose any color, what is it that that you'd like to see in the Appleton's range? And so that's how we we chose the colors that we did. Um, we we really want we really went to our customers and said what is it you want that we're not mm -hmm. supplying you with, so so yeah that's what we did, and so we we brought on four new ranges, and that was about uh, 
32 colors and there were some colors because obviously if we didn't discontinue any we would just keep growing and growing and, growing, and we'd eventually run out of warehouse space so um <laughs> we, we had we went through and we looked at colors that that really we hadn't we barely sold for years and and also even though but if we we'd had a color that we barely sold for years and there wasn't a color that was very very close to it um we still kept it in but if there was a color that was very 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 close and we hadn't sold it then we discontinued it and um but we don't we don't like doing that because you you never know when somebody might come back and say you know i've got this needlepoint that's you know i found in my granny's house and it's 50 years old and do you still do this color and we always want to be able to say yes we do so um so it's it's something that we didn't really want to do but equally you've got to move with the times you've got to bring in new colors which have been hugely popular um so yeah that's what we did yeah, you can just about guarantee the minute you quit a color, some, yeah. desi some designer will oh, use it. Sure. And... Always, yeah. <laughs> It'll like, be but you popular. Didn't want it for 20 and, years. <laughs> <laughs> yep, guaranteed every time. Yeah, yeah. So this, uh, so this becomes then an ongoing thing to to keep seeking out colors, and then I'm sure yeah. filling in color ranges is yeah. is an issue. Uh, yeah. So so our color ranges are there's a handful like brights for example whereby they they won't all necessarily be one color so we might have like for example our new cool neon range there'll be a yellow in there a green in there a blue in there a pink etc um, but most of our color ranges are it allows you to shade so that's the real reason for it so it will be a range of so say we've got marine blue and it'll be a range from dark to light and it will mean that if you are doing shading you can in theory, shade perfectly from from one color through to the end of that that range. So mm -hmm. that's how we do them. Yeah. Yeah. And and all uh, the the number of top end designers you list on your uh, on your website is is really impressive. Yeah. Uh, working closely, I assume, with some of those people just to get input. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. But that's and that's exactly how we we. Um, we worked with the with the new colors and also with you know when we when we went through that period when we when we had to discontinue some in order to bring on the new ones we we spoke to everyone and we said you know this is what we're thinking of doing is this going to cause you a problem and so yeah of course we we um we speak to our designers all the time yeah yeah well and and now two ply and four ply mm -hmm. what are we seeing in the marketplace in terms of the demand for uh, needlework, uh, cruel versus tapestry or needlepoint here in the states. What uh, what is your experience now? Well, it does vary tremendously um, to where you are in the world. We sell quite a lot to the Far East, to um, South Korea, to Japan, to China, and they are exclusively two ply. You mm -hmm. the, they wouldn't touch tapestry wool ever. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, America is probably a great mixture. Um, on the whole carpet, the, uh, one of our, as I said, said to you just now, one of our suppliers in America is, is a carpet rest, for carpet restoration, and that's all two-ply. Um, and perhaps the first oh, seven years of working with Appleton's here, we were selling more two-ply, but that has changed. That's changed quite considerably since the pandemic. Hmm. And I think the reason for that is that you've got newer stitchers coming into the into the world who are starting out with tapestry, who want it to be faster, who haven't got the patience or the time or who want to have a finished product quick, m much more quickly. And that means that they want to use tapestry wool. They want to use slightly bigger gauge canvas and and to get the job done and to you know have a finished project but there's nothing wrong with that at all um often those stitches then move on and want to do something more detailed which you can do with cruel wool and with finer canvas as as i'm sure you know yeah yeah that's, that's um, where I so it's a yeah. sort of way in if you like it's a way in um and i mean we haven't discussed yet that we've now gone into the world of kits so um we sell a lot of tapestry kits which use tapestry wool and are done on 12 count canvas. Um, and yeah, you can finish them quite quickly if you really 
get your head down and work at it. Yeah, that's an interesting um, aspect of your business because all of your uh, uh, thread is sold through distributors. I mean, I can't just yeah. buy it off your website. But then you well, have you this. Well, you can now. Oh, can yeah, we? You can now. Uh oh. Yeah, we've just just started our retail side. Yeah, I just made so, it. So, well, I mean, it's only it's only <laughs> three weeks old. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So now you can buy all our wool from directly from us as well ah. as from our distributors. Okay. Yep. Now, see, I just looked at the colors. I didn't look at whether I could buy yeah. them. <laughs> well, we've we've responded to all the requests from you know from our social media and from from email requests that people just wanted it. So we've decided to, to mm. enter that market. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and especially on the back of, of selling the kits, the kits were obviously we were selling retail too. Um, I, I don't know whether you looked at those when you were looking oh, yeah. at the website. Oh, yeah, of course I did. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, how did that come about? What, just uh, some ideas and, hey, we ought to put them together? I think we always wanted to try it. And, and so we tried with a very small number. And we have seen what works and what doesn't. And, and it's just a, a makes it a makes a more interesting company, I think, if we're, we're, we're also using our own designers. Our, so the designers who buy wool from us um, in all respects, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see, uh, n most notably Emily Peacock, who's the, who does the range of authors, the, the portraits which you saw. Mm-hmm. Um, which we can, which you're now finding in America as well. I'm happy to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, although that's not a particularly to buy kits like that um, is not a particularly American thing. We have discovered, uh, to, you know, and to buy a, 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 a printed canvas with all the wool supplied um, it, as one thing, as one item is not really how you do it in the States. On the whole, it's painted canvases that are that are then supplied separately. Right, right. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The people yeah. go through the process of selecting threads. And, exactly, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. use wool that they've got or whatever. Yeah. But um, the, the, the idea of the kit, um, which has everything you need to make a specific tapestry, um, is, very, is very much what, how it's done in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. And it keeps the price down for the for the customer in the, uh, in the long run. Yeah. Do you see that as a growth market or? Just... Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're tr we're certainly trying to crack crack the states <laughs> 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 and make them realize it's an easy way to do it. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Mm. Is it, I, I assume the states is is certainly one of your largest markets, but yes, it uh, is. Okay. Yes, it is. Uh, needlework activity has just become so global that um exactly uh, well, i still think we've got a long way to go <laughs> yeah, okay okay yeah we're working at it don't worry yeah so what uh, uh what lies on the horizon for you guys uh, uh more uh, colors uh more uh, retail effort um yeah i'd say i'd, I'd Except, say definitely exhibition. Yeah, so we've we've just started doing. Well, in fact, we did um, pre-pandemic. We used to go to some exhibitions in Germany, um, some trade exhibitions, and in fact, we've just done our first retail exhibition at the Stitch Festival in London. So that was really great to do, and I think we'd like to do, or we will be doing more of those this year. And that's it's it's good because we actually get to see who uses our wool, you know, the end user, the mm -hmm. the real customer, and. Um, yeah, so that was good fun. And in fact, we we shared a stand with Emily Peacock. So um, we worked with her on that. So we're going to be doing more. You'll see us at more festivals, more stitch, um, stitch shows. Um, we're definitely looking at increasing our kit range. So... Um, we had a brainstorming session yesterday, actually, on on what might work and and uh, and uh, sort of how what sort of areas to look at look at and um, so that was quite interesting. And then um, and we're possibly yeah, all we, we were saying, you know, it's, it, you've got to keep changing, keep moving forward. So Appleton's has got a phenomenal history, and we just want to make sure that that we keep it moving forward. So yes, we will be bringing in uh, more colours. Um, 
that though is you know it's 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 easy to say let's put in a new range of greys and <laughs> but actually the time it takes to develop those is is huge um but yes that's what we'll be doing and we always think you sort of think surely do we really need more colors of what are we what can be possibly missing with 425 colors and then you think actually no yeah we are we still are missing you know some so uh yeah we will be we will certainly be doing that yeah, that's got to be one of the most challenging things is yeah. Uh, yeah, more colors, but where and what. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And we'd then... also, sorry, we'd, all, we'd also like to, um, I meant to say as well, that to be in a position, and, and we're working on this as well, to offer our, at the moment we offer our wool in um, skeins and in hanks. And if we can offer it all on cone as well, that would be great because mm -hmm. that then opens up weavers. Um, so that's what we'd like to do too. So, um, yeah, so lots, lots, lots in the... Um, in the offing for us. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. Are you find, uh, finding wool uh, gaining in popularity? Well, there's, yes, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think people are on the whole turning away from more uh, non-natural threads. Um, I think sustainability is huge and wool is, is, is obviously incredibly sustainable. Um, yeah. So I think, I think people are, coming back to to products that are, are more natural um yeah and and sustainable and um you know when you see um and i know with with tapestry it's slightly different but i think you know if you're looking at wool from a manufacturing of clothing perspective um i think certainly young people i mean i've got teenagers and and they're very aware of clothes mountains they're very aware of of the um of the non-natural products out there and the, the damages that they cause our environment so um yeah i think wool has wool is, is has got a long way to go still yeah no and i asked that because uh, particularly in the last couple of years it seems to me wool thread is popping up more and more as something that people are using and yeah. so I was really looking for confirmation on, on what I was seeing that uh, uh, yeah. there just is more use of that. And, uh, yeah, my wife and I were talking just the other day about uh, closed mountains, yeah, and, and people yes, going that's... to thrift stores and uh, yeah. Yeah, keeping these clothes going, which is, is so fascinating because when you look back in, in uh, historic times where uh, particularly women had dresses that they kept forever and – yeah. Uh, now we just throw them away and there seems to be yeah. a movement back toward, yeah, let's have stuff that will last. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And in fact, um, I had a really good conversation with, I think somebody who, um, who you work with. So Avlia embroidery. Yes. Krista yeah. West. Mm -hmm. Krista. Yeah. So we had a really great chat because she was, she obviously does some absolutely beautiful designs, um, but hadn't done it in wool before. And we were talking and she, she said, well, let, you know, I'm going to try and do my cross stitch in wool. And, and it was just beautiful, absolutely stunning. And now she offers, um, many of her designs, um, as an option to have it in, in wool too. So with cruel wool. So yeah, cross stitching with it. Yeah, that woman, she's a design machine. <laughs> she's amazing. She's amazing. <laughs> yeah, she's something. Yeah, we, yeah, we've done several shows with her. She is uh, one of our favorites. It's, yeah, yeah. And her sense of color, uh, it, yeah, I can see the uh, your colors and what she does. Perfect fit. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, ladies, thank you so much. Boy, this has been enlightening and fun. I really appreciate the time, and it's so good to see you. Uh, a company with that history uh, rejuvenated and, and moving forward. It's really great. Aww. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's really, it's so nice to hear somebody enthusiastic about stitching. Oh, well, yeah, every day, <laughs> every day. All right. Thanks again. And thanks to everybody for listening. <laughs>